So going back to it, Egypt had a fabulous holiday, but also 110 million people and a number of them wanted to have a chat to me about international education. And again, in all these reviews and everything that we look at is Australia's got to engage with more parts of the world, not just rely so heavily on Nepal, India and China for international students. We as a country have to get our heads around the incredible youth demographic in Africa. Study New South Wales was going to take a group, I think that's unfortunately being put on the back burner for 2024. But I really think for the Australian international education sector, a plea for Austrade to consider taking a group through key parts of, of Africa for us to help get our heads around it and start to really think about how we might engage. Hi. My name's Dirk Mulder, founder of the Koala News. I'm on the road this week and I'm coming to you from the heart of Western Sydney. And I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of the Global Society on Garrigal Land here in Sydney. Good to have you in our neck of the woods, Dirk. Fantastic to be back, mate. I actually grew up out this way, so it's uh, it's wonderful to be back. And, uh, do a bit of a walk down memory lane, catching up with friends and, and working for mum and dads. It's, it's fantastic. Very nice, mate. I'm, I'm suffering from a bit of man flu today, so I, I sound a little bit hoarse. Dear listeners, I need your sympathy, so... <laughs> I'm going to let Dirk basically lead this one today, talking with a very special guest who we've got in the studio with us. Dirk, who's joining us? We we have indeed. We're, we're very fortunate to have Claire Field here, partner at Claire, well, owner of Claire Field and Associates and the most recent winner of the Professional Commentary Award for the IAA. Welcome, Claire. Thank you very much. I'm also joining from Gadigal Land. Great to have you here, Claire. And before we go any further, for those listeners who might not have come across your work, you're the host of a fantastic podcast, What Now, What Next? Tell us a little bit about that before we get into, into our topic for the day. came about in 2019 because I love listening to podcasts and a girlfriend took me aside and said, you know, lots of people across the sector, you're forever writing about, thinking about a range of different interviews. You ought to get people to come on your podcast and talk to you. And I thought, it would be really good, particularly for people who can't always go to all the conferences and hear all the, you know, clever people talking. And 100 episodes later, or 101, still going. So people still accept invitations to come along and have a chat. And thank you for the invitation to join you today. No, it's wonderful. Great to be here. You've just returned from a trip, I believe. We, we were quickly talking about this in our preparation yesterday. You've been to Egypt and Jordan. How was it? The most magnificent time. Egypt in particular. I do a quick holiday snip, but I do think actually there's some relevance to international education, which we might come to as we, as we have a chat. So pure holiday, I don't often do that. Normally my travels are linked to, to work. And I'm super fascinated by how people live, what their current lives are like, and particularly about history, right? How do people used to live? And I cannot tell you how much I love it. Jordan is great. But Egypt, I'm already planning my next trip back. It is so much history, such important history and such beauty, right? And these temples and tombs and and it's still just amazing today. So absolutely fabulous, captured a place in my heart and can't wait to go back. And the food, right? I remember being in Egypt two decades ago. The food is just out of this world. Uh, the food and the people. Uh, we were really lucky that the group that I did the tour with, and if you want to know the best tour guide in Egypt, pick me up. But the tour was structured around interactions with local people. So we actually were privileged to go and have one lunch and one dinner with different local families, welcoming us into their homes, talking to us about their lives, their kids. It was amazing. Completely fabulous. In a holiday, I uh, just that just sounds so nice. <laughs> it was great. I can't I can't remember the last, I can't remember the last holiday. So good on you. Well, you need to get it planned. Get onto it. Absolutely right. Shall we get into it? I I think there's been a lot going on this week. Let's kick off if we can with I guess the topic of caps. The last sort of week and or a little bit under a week. There's been a significant discussion in the media, particularly Channel Seven and in the News Corp papers, around whether the government will introduce caps or not. My word is that they're not but other people seem to think they are. Claire, what's your take? I would be really surprised if they were to do it. As an ex-bureaucrat, we kind of have a cap, right? There's a cry cost cap, which is supposed to be based on 
the number of students you can educate and deliver quality education to. This is obviously right being kicked around as a way to solve our housing crisis. We've got too many migrants. Ergo, we've got too many students. Let's just limit them. But trying to think through, other than the cry cost cap, quite you know boring, but quite the mechanisms of how one would do this. Right? If I'm giving a COE and a visa, but the student's not starting for six months, where do they fit? How does my cap adjust? You know, I looked on the CRICOS website as one does, and you've got universities like Monash and Sydney that have CRICOS caps of over 40,000 students. So, so how are we going to manage this? Some are coming for just a short, some are staying for longer. Given the amount of work that Home Affairs and the Department of Immigration have got to do, in terms of fixing up a whole range of visa and migration issues and more to come with the migration strategy. And government not all that good at systems and IT and infrastructure changes. So I don't think there's a magic push the button solution to this. I'm really hoping that they don't bring it in. I think it's the wrong thing to do, but actually the how would you do it strikes me as particularly challenging. Let's face it, that I mean, international education is about a lot more than the finance, but if they were to cap, then government's going to have to front up that that shortfall. And we know that that could be a very significant shortfall, not to mention the hole that that would blow in the Australian general economy with all of the other impact that international students bring to our cities, cities in our country. Oh, I was going to say, not just that, Rob, if we're talking about, about finances and, and ponying up money, then you, you throw a levy or two levies on top of that, and then you're looking at a finance model, which is completely different to what we're looking at now, costs being passed on to students left, right and centre, I would imagine. And I think a general sense of you're only important to Australia from the money we can make from you. I mean, already our international student fees are incredibly high relative to what local students pay and relative to what students would pay in other countries. And I think that's an issue. But to then be going out into the international education sector and saying, by the way, we think you don't pay enough. We're going to tax you so we can give the money rather than taxpayers to fund our own sons and daughters going to university. It's a terrible message to send to people. Yeah. I mean, I saw they've got two folks from the Grattan Institute put out a story in the Sydney Morning Herald, I want to say it was yesterday, that were provocating that visa for visa fees should go up to about 2,500 to disencourage students. Again, I mean, we start thinking about these disincentive models and, and it, you're absolutely right, Claire, the message that we're sending to the marketplace, when the message that we're sending to students who potentially will be future alumni and ambassadors of Australia is just incredible. I mean, it's it the mind boggles, really. It's the complete opposite of what the International Education Association of Australia has been fighting for. I mean, they've been putting members' money behind a, you know, ad campaigns to try and raise this awareness of the great impact that international ed has on this country, not just from a financial point of view, just the impact that the humans have in our society. And, you know, to try and undermine that, that message, which is so critical, oh, yeah. it's, it's frustrating. <laughs> I penned a piece yesterday on visas and visa rejections. And so on one hand, we talk a lot about the soft power that Australia gains through the positive experiences that international education brings to people who come here and, and, and return home. You know, the classic stories of ministers in Malaysian governments, et cetera, et cetera. Personally, I hate that term soft power. I think they're friends. You know, they're people who know us well and, and they're people who know how to work with us and, and we know how to work with them. It's wonderful. Put Flip that coin. If you're a student in India or Kuala Lumpur or Bangkok and you get your visa rejected for potentially a, a, a reason that isn't necessarily clear, what kind of impression do you have of Australia then? So when we talk about that positivity that engaging with international global, international audiences and international students has, we, as you say, Rob, we're just completely eroding it by students who won't come here. They've spent possibly the better part of a year preparing for coming here. They've lost $710 on a student visa. They've lost their migration fees. They've lost all sorts of other, other financial incentives. And then they end up in Canada, who opens them with open arms. And what does that say for the next 50 years of their life when they want to work internationally? Who are they going to go and work with? It's incredible. Well, it also is looking at it purely through a finance perspective. And I, and I do think that's right. I think you've picked up the, the human element. I was surprised and a bit disappointed. Bruce Chapman, fabulous, you know, grandfather, father of, of Hex, and all of his important economic modelling that he's done for Australia and Australian higher education. 
And he came out actually saying, you know, from a purely economic perspective, it would probably have minimal impact in student decision making if you put a five or ten percent levy on students. Citing some work from Simon Marginson, elasticity of demand, and you know other economic concepts. And yet, I think the human element of conveying that message to parents wanting the best future for their sons or daughters is entirely missed in that economic. Converse and analysis. And going also to your point, Dirk, about Canada, some data out last week, I think, from, was it ISIF or someone had done some analysis of, no, it was on, I caught it later, Holland IQ webinar about growth in international education a, a few weeks ago. And looking back over about a decade, right? And everyone has grown their, as a destination country, has grown their international student numbers but shrunk as part of a growing pie, right? That growing demand for international education, except Russia, question mark, and Canada, right? Who has been explicitly wanting people to come and study with them. So that's the other thing that we miss when we think about, oh, too many international students. The fact is that the world is hopefully increasingly global and young people, particularly in places like Asia and Africa, can't yet get the educational opportunities that they need at home. No, you're absolutely right. Let's Let's kind of move kind of into a tangent, if I can. Reviews are going on, and obviously the discussion that we've just had about CAP stems from those reviews. In terms of the reviews, I mean, it seems to me that there's a view across those reviews that private vet seems to be the target of a number of reforms. Claire, your background, you're, you have a significant background in private vet. How do you see, I mean, for me, it's it seems to be the old labour tradition of TAFE over private vet being personified. How do you see it? Are you, is that, am I right on that, or is that kind of in the background? I think a lot of private vet providers would agree with you. I think to be fair to the government, they came to power with, we're going to put TAFE at the heart of the vet sector. That was their election platform. And in the domestic sphere, that's what they're doing. There's a couple of measures that have been proposed in the um, re uh, interim report of the Joint Standing Committee, which do privilege TAFE above private vet providers. But most of the other measures that are being put out that would have a negative impact on the private vet sector come about because of some absolutely abhorrent behaviour by a small number of private vet providers, right? The Nixon review is horrifying to think that there are private vet providers in Australia who've been involved in some way in sex trafficking. I mean, it's, it's just terrible in bringing people in for for work rather than study and turning a blind eye, you know, explicitly and deliberately to people not turning up. Now, that's not the fault of good private vet providers. And that's what I liked about the Nixon review. It was a really targeted set of measures designed to actually crack down on those who are most problematic. Much of what's in that Joint Standing Committee's interim report is positive for the sector, but there are some measures in there that would make it easier for TAFE to recruit students relative to private vet providers. But again, if you're looking from a government perspective, she says with a former government hat on, well, there are valid reasons for that, right? TAFE institutes haven't been caught up with, right, this abhorrent behaviour. So they're a much lower risk category and much easier to wrap a suite of the easier measures around. The challenge and the harder piece is how government ought to engage to really get rid of the appalling providers and to allow those who do a good job and have great outcomes for their students to continue to flourish. And that's the bit that we're going to need to wait, I think, again, to the migration strategy and the update to the international education strategy, national strategy for international education, whatever label we give it, I think that's where we're going to see whether they've got those distinctions right or not. Yeah, absolutely. I think Minister Clare is um, planning on putting together a strategic update or a sector strategic update uh, early next year. So I think more, more certainly my impression at this point is that those five reviews which are going on at the moment, including uh, the Future of Work review done by Treasury, are all going to be distilled into some sort of sectorial macro view, I guess, if you want to put it that way, and, and released early next year. So it will be interesting to see certainly what's happened over the next 
next few weeks in terms of the migration review anticipating coming out uh, and then how that's distilled by government into what that means for the sector. So like like you say, it's, it, watch this space, eh? Well, one thing we haven't talked about, which isn't about private vet providers and I think has gone under-discussed, is there is a recommendation in the Joint Standing Committee, and this kind of relates to this, this international student tax. There's a recommendation early on in that interim report of the Joint Standing Committee that government needs to, I can't remember the precise language, but and have a look at whether it's a good idea. All the CBD university campuses, which are not in any way linked to the actual university that they, you know, purport to be a part of, that are not managed by the university and that are overwhelmingly international students, often just from one or two countries. Is that really what international education in Australia ought to be about? Is that something that government might want to have a look at? Because it has funding implications, right? If universities are doing this because it's a, a source of revenue they typically can't get international students or not many of them to their campuses if they're not in the CBD. And, and I mean, that's what lies at the heart of the international student tax, that uh, some universities have an advantage over others because of their longevity, because of their attractive locations, because of their alumni, and it would be a means of evening things out. Well, it, better way of evening things out might be that those lovely universities might need a little bit less taxpayer money and perhaps we could divert our taxpayer money more to those universities who have a greater need for it. So I think that relation between international education policy and domestic policy, particularly in higher ed, is worth a sector keeping an eye on. Yeah, the one thing that I've always thought, and it's really interesting, you, you pick up that kind of regional to urban divide. I think there's been, you know, there's obviously been cracks, if I can put it that way. Sorry, not cracks. Cracks kind of mean a gap opening, but um, there's, been, there's been a crack at the government putting regional universities first and incentivising students to go to regions. I wonder if there's a viewpoint there to further incentivise that actually occurring, particularly for regional towns. When we talk about accommodation crises, we're talking about major urban centres. So to actually in encourage international students to get out into the regions more may actually solve some of those problems that we're talking about. Could be, although I think there are some regional areas that have got some accommodation issues as well. Oh, absolutely. And certainly I, I apologise, that shouldn't have been a blanket statement, but it's it's definitely you know, comparable to, to the major urban centres. There's generally more space in the regions. But... Well, and there are houses where people often have spare bedrooms, right? And this is way that, you know, we can have a bit of extra income, cross-cultural, right, exchange between international students and locals, everybody wins. Maybe I'm just too simple. No, I agree. I agree. So it looks like IDP, well, certainly IDP has brought out a new English test. It's going to be really interesting to see how this goes. Obviously, IDP has shares in the IELTS exam, and now they're launching a new product based on AI and a, certainly a digital kind of view. It'll be interesting to see how this one flies. There's other products in the market that have probably struggled to get government approval that have been heavily based in the digital world. Envoy, that's what it's called by IDP. Claire, have you seen much about this? What, what's your thoughts? I haven't seen a whole lot about it, but I'm pretty familiar with, you know, Duolingo's attempt to get itself approved here and I think it's quite fascinating that you know they've recruited the fabulous Brett Blacker to come on board and you know give them some some extra grunt and and certainly someone who knows Canberra really really well I mean it seems to me at some point government has to make the shift that artificial intelligence is a much done properly done well is a much better way of assessing a whole range of things, including language abilities, it is, in my mind, purely a matter of time that officials can wrap their heads around the reliability and validity of these tests and that everybody does not need to sit in the same room sitting a three-hour test to have a really solid, uh, reliable indicator of their English language ability. So strap in, it's going to come. It's just a question of timing, I think. Uh, using buzzwords at the moment, uh, probably based on quality and integrity. <laughs> well, we hope it's all based on quality and integrity. Absolutely. 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 This is one of those examples of where we clearly see independent organisations, businesses just leading the charge, embracing technology and, and all that it can do. And it's going to be interesting, not just in terms of the English language testing, but all elements of higher education and, and the like, as to how fast government moves to embrace 
this sort of technology. I mean, just think about visa processing, for example, how great AI could be in working through some of those bottlenecks. So I'm kind of excited just to see this technology starting to come into the scene and to see the way that government's going to be pushed over the years ahead to to embrace it. Another big topic this week has been around graduate employment and international students seeking employment once, uh, once graduated, obviously either via a 485 pathway or not. Lee Tran and her colleagues at Deakin and the University of Adelaide have dusted off some research which was done last year. Some really, really interesting stuff came out of it. IT was actually the most employed career area. The research also showed that 82% of Indian students considered the 48 visa as opposed to 74% for non-Indian nationals. So Indians clearly have a a, a larger disposition towards seeking work or, or employment post-graduation. And interestingly enough, those who saw migration as their end goal, obviously saw the 485 as their major pathway towards it. Those who didn't see migration as a, as a major pathway still valued the 485, but it was based around professional engagement and enhancing their employability back home through those professional experiences. So again, still a, ver a really useful tool in that. Claire, graduate employment. I mean, we're obviously, it's really hard to talk about in the in the space of all these reviews because so much is going on. But you'd like to think that great that the reason international education is so important to this country is that we're training people who come here. They're familiar with our local our, our local communities, our, the way we do things. They seem, to, I've always thought, they seem to be they should be at the top of the list in terms of of our hit list of who we want to stay. But maybe that's not right. Oh no, it absolutely is right. I think there's two things on that though. One, we are of course awaiting the migration review, and Minister Claire O'Neill has said. She intends to make it easier for high value students to be able to stay and become permanent residents. So, so presumably for a cohort of students, is it all university or higher education graduates? Question, don't know. But for some, it will potentially be even easier to A, get a visa, to stay for longer and et cetera. For the others, I'm not quite sure what happens and that potentially becomes problematic. Yes, with the current arrangements and current cohorts, of course we should be valuing these graduates and looking to, to offer them employment. You know, we've got low unemployment at the moment and skill shortages across a range of different areas. But government, business peak bodies and the sector have been really poor at explaining to employers the straightforwardness of these visa arrangements and so and also pointing out to them that now most people don't step into their graduate role and stay for a decade so when they're thinking about taking on an international student there's the mentality of oh my god all the paperwork and all of that big hassle and they're only going to stay for a few years so i'm putting in all this investment and then they'll go home Ignoring the fact that the local kid that they might recruit could duck off in six months to an employer down the road. So I think there's a piece of work wherever these changes land in terms of making it easier for some, hopefully more, graduates to stay. There's a big comms piece that's needed between those three kind of stakeholder groups. Yeah, I agree. Oh, when I think back over the last sort of 10 years, the one thing that really baffles me is we've had so many graduates come through that haven't, as you say, kind of stuck in their profession. Um, we see people, you know, obtain visas, but then they're off doing another role in society. I think that the missing the missing piece for me has always been, if you're graduating from a Master of Professional Accounting, what's the incentive to go into accounting? Because it seems like accounting's been on the skills shortage list for a very, very long time, and and we and we haven't filled those vacancies. So that's the missing piece to me is getting those graduates who are should be excited about the topic area that they're studying, moving into the profession and, and getting them to stick in that profession. I don't know. It's just it seems it seems like there just needs to be a bit of work there. And I should just say hats off to I think other states have followed as well, but hats off to Study New South Wales and Seek. And I think they won their award at the IAA Awards this year for their innovative partnership, actually bringing employers to a jobs fair with international students and then seek having job adverts particularly focused on international students while they're studying and I think after graduation. So there is some 
a shift happening, but we've got an awful lot more to do, I think. No, I agree. I agree. So the Council of International Students, WA, celebrated its 30th conference and 60th year of operation. It's a great op- a great organisation that operates primarily in Western Australia and Perth, looking after students and the sector in that in that state. Thank you very much for the CISWA for, for inviting me along. It was a fantastic day. So a big shout out to them. Lastly, before the, certainly from my end, the 2023 Bahasa Sesh Challenge, which is run by Achichis, their winner has been announced. And the winner is a student from UNSW, Alina Malik. And Alina's won a one session of won a one session of an Indonesian language short course valued at over three thousand dollars. And I just want to make a kind of put out a, a big shout out to to a teacher who run this competition. To me it's one of those competitions that just seems to nail the perfect spot. They're an organisation that have had immense impact across Southeast Asia over the last 10 to or over the last probably 20 years. You'll notice that oh, there's a lot of senior government people who work in the area are alumni of a teachers. But this program itself, it just seems to hit the sweet spot. It's all about being able to describe an Indonesian word or phrase. You put it in a video, you put it online. It's fun, it's engaging, and it even had my daughter's primary school engaged. So it's just, it's. I think this is one to watch over the next 10 years. And this could be a real cherry on the pie for language uh, education across Australia. Fantastically done. Yeah, just jumping in on that. So it's just the Australian Consortium for In-Country Indonesian Studies. It's such a fantastic model. Many people are probably unaware of that organisation, but it really is a benchmark of collaboration between Australian universities to get more students out into, up to our closest neighbour and understand the language and the culture This organisation has been ticking along for, what, 30 years plus now and just continues to add so much value to to our country. So, yeah, a very good initiative to raise their profile a little bit and and well worthy of a shout-out on the news. Absolutely. Last observation from me and a a shout-out and a big request perhaps to Austrade. So going back to Egypt, had a fabulous holiday, but also 110 million people and a number of them wanted to have a chat to me about international education. And again, in all these reviews and everything that we look at is Australia's got to engage with more parts of the world, not just rely so heavily on Nepal, India and China for international students. We as a country have to get our heads around the incredible youth demographic in Africa Study New South Wales was going to take a group, I think that's um, unfortunately been uh, put on the back burner for 2024. But I really think um, for the Australian international education sector, a plea for Austrade to consider taking a group um, through key parts of, of Africa for us to help get our heads around it and start to really think about how we might engage. About 40 to 50, those, as you were talking, Claire, looked up the 2021 census. And about 50,000 people claim Egyptian heritage here in Australia. So it's not an insignificant number of of people in the local population. Good observation. And you've got hundreds of millions right across, you know, a whole range of other countries. And and let's have more. Well, folks, thank you so much for joining us today. Claire, amazing to have you with us. Once again, What Now, What Next is the podcast available in all podcast feeds, all the places you get your usual podcasts. Make sure you check that out. Covers awesome topics like just running through the, the topic list there, the whole gamut of Australian higher education. So there's something in there for literally everybody. And Dirk, as always, thanks for joining us again, mate, and bringing us the news. TheKoalaNews.com is your source for Australian international education news. Make sure you check that out as well. It's been great chatting with you both. And let's do this again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you, Claire and Rob. Feel better. I hope, uh, I hope you get over the bug, mate. Absolutely. Thank you, both. Appreciate it. See you next time. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.